everyone, and welcome to the MPO Show Reviews. This is Jim Scork, and with me I have Norman Sanso. Howdy, partner. Please don't you ever do that again. <gasps> and awesome brony reviewer, Silver Quill. My luck is almost as bad as Trouble Shoes, but my attitude, twice as bad. <laughs> At least you didn't start that with a <laughs> Wild West countryism. Oh, oh shucks! I should do it more harder next time. What the hell am I saying? You, you cannot, you cannot say more harder. That is grammatically wrong. <laughs> I got no idea, so I'm gonna stop it right now. Norman, did you take your pills, your old man pills, for your amnesia and other things that you have? Uh, nope. Ah, oh, good grief. Well, we are already off the rails, and today we are reviewing episode 6 of season 5, overall episode number 97, titled Appaloosa's Most Wanted, written by the rebellious Dave Polsky. And yes, from now on I'm going to introduce Dave Polsky as the rebellious after his awesome dissertation at Back 2014. So now you're not changing my mind, he's the rebellious Dave Polsky from now on. And in the plot of this episode, we have the Cutie Mark Crusaders going to Opelousa's rodeo, uh, and right in the middle of the rodeo, it gets stopped because of an apparent outlaw called Troubleshoes. So they set themselves to bring this Troubleshoes guy to justice. Now, that is the skinny of the episode and what it's supposed to be on the surface, but it really isn't. Because this is kind of one of the most misleading episodes in the entire season, if you ask me. But... Don't ask me yet. I will be the last one to say, because what did you guys think of this one? This one was hard to categorize, to be honest, because here we are. We've got we're back in Appaloosa, which is a town I really enjoyed. I liked it in Over a Barrel. Uh, but there's not as much to the town as there was before, at least in my eyes. We have Bray Burns back. He's been seen but not heard for several seasons, but now he's got a speaking role again. And he's a lot less reliable than he was in the past. Uh, and then we have Troubleshoes, this great new stallion. Love his personality. Love his uh, Eeyore-isms. <laughs> and yet we also have just the realization cutie marks are just a big headache. They, make, <laughs> they really, you change the rules on them all the live long day. All the time. And in the end, we learn that the Crusaders have weird script scene powers. As they, more than any other, can know what the, the cutie mark truly means. Script seeing powers. I wish I had that. That would make life so simple. As for me, I don't know. Watching this episode, it was fun to see Appaloosa again. It was fun to see how everything is, how the environment looked like. But I'm just wondering what happened to Littlefoot, was it? And what happened to the rest of the bisons? What happened to them? Just, how do I put this? What happened to them? Why are they not here? Or is the community still separate? Or they're not working together? And, I don't know. I mean, I'm harping on one thing, but the episode overall... Maybe it's not a stomping ground season in Appaloosa, so that's why we don't see any of the buffaloes. Yeah, probably. Well, we we probably. do see two buffaloes. Yeah, I mean, yeah but in a flashback... Flash that's yeah, the funny thing uh, is that we see them in a flashback. Isn't that weird? Yeah, and also Brayburn. Brayburn coming back is awesome. I don't know what to say about Brayburn. Brayburn is... How do I put this? I think I can see what Brayburn is here. Like, he is not good with kids. And <laughs> the poor fella is just <laughs> tired. <laughs> He's bored of his skull. Oh, you should sympathize with him then. Always tired, not good with kids. It finds uh, you to a team, Norman. I know. Woo. <laughs> uh, but oh. overall, overall, I mean, the episode itself, not bad. Uh, but like, as, like Silver said, script scene powers near the end. Mm. I still don't understand what you guys are meaning with all this script power scene. You're going to have to explain it to me because I'm kind of lost on that. Uh, I have no idea what script powers is. Um, this episode is, in my honest opinion, the best representation that the fan, that the, not the fandom, but, well, yeah, but that the fandom has received about the Wild West within the My Little Pony setting. I mean, yeah, okay, it does have a few problems here and there. It has a f couple of inconsistencies. It doesn't have any buffaloes, uh, or any, uh, any expansion on the town whatsoever. We don't see more of that. 
and the character of Braeburn is a bit wasted. Um, however, among the things that it doesn't have is Twilight freaking Sparkle, stopping every five panels to talk about bureaucracy, red tape, and saying, what can you do? I cannot sub these criminals into a jail, uh, into a jail cell. So, in my honest opinion, this episode is like hips and bounds above the good, the bad, and the ponies when it comes to Wild West re- re- representation in Equestria. So, yeah, you know, considering, uh, also I didn't like Opera Barrel all that much. So, yeah, this is, as far as it goes, the, the best Wild West story we have had in MLP ever. I love the fact that Dave Polsky comes back to Opelousa, a town that he, uh, that he helped create because he did wrote Opera Barrel and made a better use of the characters. Because during the entire episode, I didn't feel like I wanted to strangle any of them. <laughs> I like the character of, uh, Serif Silverstar. I think he was, uh, he was very good. He was very likable. And I like Troubleshoes. I was very surprised at how they, uh, they introduced this character and how they, they put him together. So, yeah, very much like this episode. It's kind of like a low step compared to what Polsky was doing in season four. But I very much enjoyed it. I think it was a very good, very fun, very stupid episode. <laughs> but it's still fun and enjoyable. It was stupid, but it was fun and enjoyable. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's how it put it. But that's my, uh, that's, that's, uh, that's our first impressions. If you want to watch the episode before uh, we go hip deep into spoilers and we start talking about it, uh, you should stop right now because from now on it's just a spoiler talk. And we're going to talk about big spoilers anyway. So, shall we go for it? Yep. Troubleshoes big spoilers. Because you know, <laughs> Because you know that's the biggest impact from this episode, right? There, there is no big, there is no big Macintosh anymore. There's only moderately impressive Macintosh. Indeed. Yeah, I mean they com- they made a comparison with him and Troubleshoes, and wasn't Troubleshoes so so tall that uh, Big Mac will only reach all the way up to his neck? He's massive. Yeah, I think we gotta deal. With, we gotta handle this one first before we get into the spoilers. His his build, his design, it's Beyond well, the well, well, standard no, no, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. If we're going to talk about troubleshoots, we have we're going to talk spoilers anyway because the way that they put it in the in the synopsis, he is an outlaw, but he really isn't, or is he? <laughs> so we have to talk about that in the episode. So I say we we can save the discussion about his design, uh, when when we get to him. All right, Very all right. Good. From now on, spoiler alert. So careful, guys. We're going to ruin the episode for ya. So we begin in uh, Palooza right away with the CMCs looking everywhere as they see all these uh, opportunities to get a new cutie mark and <laughs> all the different events that are uh, presented in the, in the rodeo, including rodeo clowns, which I have never heard of. This. So Silver, you, you are the uh, resident Murrican of the MBS show here. Have you ever been to a rodeo? And if you have, how accurate is this representation of rodeos? Mm, I have been, when I was very young, I remember it smelled like poo. Because, <laughs> you know. You know <laughs> of what course. The cows do. Uh, rodeo clowns are really not there just for the entertainment of the audience. When a rider, they have uh, competitions where you ride a bucking a bronco or even a buffalo. When they, when the rider falls, it's the rodeo clown's job to rush in, keep the bull distracted so the rider can get f- clear. And then they themselves will often dive into barrels or behind barriers where the bull can't get to them. They're clowns because brightly, I think, I'm not sure if bulls are, and Broncos can see in color, um. but the, but the elaborate costumes are supposed to help draw its attention and, trick the audience into thinking this is all just in fun, even though you could really get hurt. Mm. If, so, to so, your, so, sorry, Silver, to your comment about the bulls and the colors, I think from what I heard before, when bullfighters, metadors, uh, when they shake their capes to attack the bull or to attract the bull, it's not the color red, but it's mostly the movement of the mantle or kick that's attracting the bull. But continue, please. Well, in that case, it's probably just the elaborate costume that has a lot of uh, activity and motion to it. Uh, they, you know, they play up their actions big and cartoony. So that would all be meant to attract the attention towards them because they've got a running start and the rider can get clear. 
so in some ways that kind of, if you know this, then the episodes take again on trouble shoes, which we'll get to, it might take a little bit of hit, but then, well, we're not looking at the show for a proper documentary of rodeos. <laughs> I know for a fact there's no haystacking competition. Uh, <laughs> okay. And I'm not, uh, uh, I'm not really sad about that, but I do think during this episode, you know, that what I loved about o- Over a Barrel season one is that the whole town was just chock full of jokes. It was rapid fire one after another horse drawn carriages. Now horse drawn horse drawn carriages. <laughs> and I just thought, Oh, that's magnificent. This one, there, there were some humor bits. There were some wonderful, uh, town setting, uh, humor like, it's trouble shoes. Harmonica plays in the distance. <laughs> oh, I <hi>, clown guy. <laughs> <laughs> Could you please stop it? <laughs> but then I just, uh, then I, I look at this rodeo and I think, oh, there's all kinds of funny things they could do in the background. They're not doing any funny things in the background. Not until it's time for the clowns and that's like a main event because it's the triumph of trouble shoes. I just felt like some of the vitality wasn't there. I I think the one of the one of the reasons for this to happen maybe is that um maybe they were taking um they were roping in so to speak uh Dave Polsky's uh, writing when it comes to that they didn't want they they might not want the the uh, the slapstick to go uh, meet the Spartans or disaster movie or any of that it's like they 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 wanted to have the few sets of slapstick maybe focused on travel shoes and travel shoes alone so every other part of comedy might fall flat on that because when trouble shoes shows up he's kind of like the oj simpson of the naked gun movies you know he's like he's tripping over everything he's falling over everything and he's just ending with like several bowling balls on his head if you know what i mean i know what you're saying yeah, so I I think they focused the comedy on him and forgot about everything else. I'm not saying you are wrong, but I am. Maybe that is an explanation as to why. Ah, uh, but if that be the case, then it's just sort of sad, because that Appaloosa. I I loved the humor in Appaloosa that comes with it, and to sort of leave that aside or to to sacrifice that for one character, well, if the one character's humor doesn't work, then you're up a creek, and over a barrel. Yeah. <laughs> ha ha ha. Uh but no, but I, I, I would agree with you. I I still don't like Opera Barrel, but I think I see what you're where you're coming with this one. Like there is no comparison with the final pie fight at the end of Opera Barrel uh when compared to the final triumph of, of Travel Shoes at the end of the episode. Like there they are two different types of comedy while still being slapstick. I don't know how to continue with this one really because we are not really following the, the order. The order of the episode. I mean, we can try because, well, it's basically the Applejack got invited to Appaloosa by Brayburn because Brayburn hurt his front hoof. So now uh, Applejack needs to help Brayburn in the rodeo stuff and win. That's about it. And the CMC tag along. Yeah. All I can say is Brayburn should be glad that uh, Equestria is not going by real world rules. <laughs> yes. Uh, no. Uh, well, oof, well, very much. I don't think the fans will allow it, though. Oh yeah. <laughs> don't you kill my horse, Bando? <laughs> oh no. <laughs> I noticed uh, something. Applejack sure has a tendency to poke people where they hurt. She's a little sadist. <laughs> oh no. They do realize that Trouble Shoes is going around the town, and he is. Uh, he has. He's been known for ruining other rodeos. All over the place. And uh, uh, Sheriff Silverstar, uh, even though he has a moment of weakness, saying that they might call off the, ent- the entire rodeo all along, he is like, ah, nah, screw that. We're not going to call it off. We're going to bring this guy to justice and we're going to continue with the rodeo. Which instantly makes this guy better than... Uh, what was the name of the sheriff on, on the... I'm sorry, I'm going to keep going to the MLP comics. Because this episode does a few things that the MLP comics did wrong. So... The sheriff on the other on, on the comics, he's giving up. He's like, "Nah, I don't want to do this. I don't want to keep going." I'm and the, Silver Star is not like that. He's like, "Ah, to hell with this. We are doing it." I think there's two different mindsets or two different situations to the matter here because in the, the situation comic, in the situation in the comic was more desperate. Yeah, I know. Yeah, because <laughs> in the comic, the bulls 
were rampaging and doing damage to the town. And this one, the troubleshoot is just accidentally destroying the well, you don't, rodeo. You don't, you don't know that yet at the moment that yeah, this but, episode is, but, uh, is playing. Yeah, but in the situation or the mindset here is um, troubleshoot, known villain or known bad guy, just likes to wreck rodeos. So if the rodeo's not around, the townspeople will be safe. So it's a two different gravity of the situation. It's just the bulls were wreaking havoc to, um, I forgot the town's name. And in over here, it's just the rodeo. So if the rodeo's gone, trouble shoes won't be there. So I, I think it's two different set of situation and gravity to the situation. Well, for, uh, also for the memory's sake, the sheriff of, uh, the, of uh, the good, the bad, the ponies. His name was Sheriff Tumbleweed. Though mm, when he gave, when he, when he gave up and wanted to take up music, he was going to turn his change his name to Honky Tonk, <laughs> thereby add, adding fuel to my naming versus nurture debate. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I like his, I like the spirit of uh, of uh, Sadif Silver Star, Silver Star. I I don't know. I kind of like these characters that are like I am not giving up. I'm gonna continue. I'm gonna go on. I will survive. I I like that. I I, I can sympathize. <laughs> I'm sure probably can... was the same too because at first what? he could be one of those sheriffs that I will not stop. This travesty will not happen blah 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 but i can sympathize with uh, silver star though but i cannot sympathize with tumbleweed yeah, because we but, didn't see him at his proudest um but i'm gonna i'm gonna stop comparing the comic with the with the tv show they're complete they have two completely different entities i mean yeah. it's uh I, I even i realize that it is getting unfair hmm. but i mean when it comes to wild west stories i am very critical because i am a fan of westerns i love westerns they're one of the pillars of uh of storytelling when it comes to movies and when it comes to comic books and uh, books. I mean, westerns are a very basic story. I very much like how they are tackling this western story better than the other times they have. Uh, but to go back to the episode, Applejack realizes that the situation is way too dangerous, so she prepares the CMCs to go back to the to Ponyville uh, while she returns to the rodeo to keep performing and puts Brayburn to look after them. Which doesn't go all that well because he falls asleep. Well, and what a position to fall asleep on, isn't it? <laughs> well, he has been taking care of the CMC till night time. No, 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 I, no, no. I mean the bend over position that Brayburn is falling asleep on. I mean, no, that. I'm gonna see anything. This is going don't, to be on. Oh, don't worry. The fandom is saying anything and uh, he's saying everything and all that now. Please, no. <laughs> let's not see anything that we're going to regret. Oh, I will regret. Oh, come on. This is Brayburn we're talking about. He has been shipped with literally every pony, dare I say, entity in the show. <laughs> I'm pretty sure he fans were kind of expecting him to take that pose at some point. <laughs> he, he is the male uh, rainbow dash. Okay, okay, okay. And, he, and he's not going to take this lying down. Uh, no, he's taking this one bent over. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, Norman, you cannot stop the ride when it starts. I can sure hell let's try it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, you're an you're, old man. You are free to try. <laughs> you can try, but you will fail. You know you will fail. Hello. You will all fail. <sighs> <sighs> Any road. Uh, the CMCs take this opportunity and they decide to sneak out and go to uh, the outskirts of Appaloosa, which are composed of a forest. I wasn't expecting a forest to be in this place, especially yeah. because the last time that we went here, there was no such thing as a forest. So something tells me that that apple orchard that they were uh, they were uh, planting has gone out of control. That's true, because the last time when we see Appaloosa, it was... Uh, desert country like in Texas. I'm not sure if Texas has swamps or not, but I'm sure from the scene we saw Appaloosa last, this was not there. Now you gotta go further uh, east to get into swamp territory. But then you're in Florida. <laughs> I make no comments. <laughs> uh, I don't want to be in Florida. Our apologies to the Floridians. I'm sorry. I have a problem. I hate Florida. 
We know that you are a proud and noble race of freaky, <laughs> freaky weirdos. Uh, no comment. Uh, I could comment for a la- for a while. No comment. And never stop. Never no stop. comment. Uh, never mind. Uh, but yeah, I I want to bring the uh, to bring out a detail on the the animation on this on this segment where they are lost in the middle of the forest. The owl that we see there, that is a completely new design, and it kind of struck me. We don't have the, the cutesy wootsy looking owls from season one. Like, if you look at the, the owls that we see on the Stairmaster, they look laughable compared to this one. This one looks like a, like a straight up ruffled, racked up owl. I like it. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of weird. I'm harping on that detail, but I kind of like that owl design. Well, they used, they, they drew new assets, so that's good. It, it, and it is very atmospheric. I love the mist that floats in the middle of the forest. And the, the way that the, the horseshoe marking, uh, it fills up with the water as, as the rain comes. That is so neat. I'm like, this, there are so many cool little details in this scene. Hmm. Uh, but still, Scootaloo's afraid of the forest. Well, of course, he's a chicken. <laughs> uh, meanwhile, meanwhile, Sweetie Belle's like, we shouldn't be doing this, you guys, but then she does it anyway. It's like, you know, Sweetie, just voicing dissent doesn't make you the smart one. <laughs> uh, but it's all for one and one for all. Who's more foolish, the fool or the fool who follows her? <laughs> <laughs> no comment. Well, it doesn't take long for uh, Applejack to discover that Braver has lost the Phillies. So she goes to get the help from Serif Silverstar, who is playing poker or whatever at the uh, at the saloon. I think that's the uh, sheriff's office, if I'm not mistaken. I, well, it looks it looks it looks like the saloon because you can see the doors open, like the doors in the saloon. Mm, yeah, yeah. You yeah. know the, the 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 flap doors or or how how are you call those? Uh, it is not the sheriff's office. It does look like the saloon, though. But he's playing with his deputies, so that's neat. <laughs> Instead of doing their jobs. Well, well Equestria is a peaceful town. Yeah, consider that sometimes the lawmen in the world that this is, that the, we are presented, they don't have to deal with many drunkards, uh, shooting, uh, guns or anything like that. There is no guns in Equestria, for all we know. They use pies. So, no, don't that, go outside that... on the street throwing pies at people. <laughs> I, I, after the latest comic, I kind of have to. <laughs> oh, yeah. We, we haven't talked about that one yet. Maybe later. Oh, I don't know about number 30 yet. I haven't read it yet. Please don't spoil anything. <laughs> okay. Uh, but I will say, you know, they do have to throw out, uh, people from the salt block. <laughs> who, ponies from the salt block, I should say, who have overindulged in the salty goodness. Oh, yes, the salty goodness. Brayburn is a constant customer of the salty goodness. Uh, I like that salty goodness. Uh, come on, no, come on. <laughs> Ooh, we learned something new about you today. Draw in fan art of the salty goodness. Anyway, <laughs> um, we cut to the, to the CMCs, uh, ended up stranded in the middle of the forest. Nowhere else to go except to, uh, a rocked cart or a caravan or whatever you call it. It's a caravan, right? I think so. Could does be. look like does look like a caravan, and um, they hide inside. And sadly, they don't find Trixie in, but <laughs> they do find the real troubleshoes. Who, like I said before, as soon as he steps in, he starts knocking himself over everything so hard that he blacks out the entire episode. And like and, I say, Big Macintosh is immediately downgraded. Yeah, yeah. because this like, character, oh my god, the build, the design. I was surprised when I first saw I, him. I and to be honest, I I I say to be honest now now that, now that I think about it. But to be perfectly honest, this is my favorite part of the entire episode. And I don't mean this scene. I mean this character. Trouble Shoes is awesome. I just love how awesome this guy is. Not just his design, but the way that he is uh, built as a character. I like that he's like a oversized, overgrown version of Eeyore from uh, yeah. Winnie the Pooh. Oh yeah. But all the way down to his all the way down to his kindness. He's not a bad guy. And straight up they they, they say that uh in the way that he's presented. He's not evil. He's just large. He's huge. He's massive. Mm-hmm. He's I mean and when compared to the to the Kitty Mark Crusaders, he's even bigger. I mean yeah. he's a giant. 
Yeah, because uh, there's a scene here where Troubleshoes is standing or moving and the CMCs are just tall as his feet below the cutie mark. So, wow, he is huge. And I, I don't know what to say because when I saw when I first saw him, I thought I was looking at a horse instead of a pony. It's because he's, he's pretty much a full-on Clydesdale. He just had the ultimate growth spurt. But, you know, it's funny with... Uh, at some point, we'll have to talk about Troubleshoes' humor. Mm-hmm. It, well, it starts out kind of funny with the slapstick. It it changes uh, as the episode goes on. Mm-hmm. In fact, very quickly. So I don't know how quickly we want to do that because we we can get into the CMC script reading powers. Yeah, explain that to me, please, because I'm kind of lost on this uh, on this exp- exp- explanation. Like, what is the what is the script powers uh, exactly? Basically, it's the idea that when a character is having some unique insight, and you're not sure what they're basing this on, other than the fact that the script wants them to make this observation. Mm -hmm. Ergo, they must have a copy of the script somewhere on hoof. Uh, I think Apple Apple Bloom has the uh, script tucked away behind her bow. Yep. (laughs) If you think about it, like what Silver's here saying and explaining is, think about it this way. The CMCs... How long have they been trying to get their cutie mark? And how do they know that Troubleshoes is misinterpreting his cutie mark when they don't have theirs? And they've been doing everything since season one to get it. So how? And like Silver says, script reading power. All right, all right. Though uh, I do like the, I do like, I do like the, 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 theme that they are treating on this episode from the introduction of, of Troubleshoes is that he misinterpreted the meaning of his cutie mark. And I, okay, they could have done it in a better manner. I mean, something a bit less um, ambiguous mm-hmm. <laughs> because it's like, well, upside down horseshoe, how does that relate to comedy? Shouldn't it have been like a horseshoe with a clown nose or a or a but, clown horn or something like that? But that would but, be too obvious. That would be too yeah, well, obvious. That, yeah, that's okay. Yeah, when it comes to uh, uh, when it comes to uh, the the meaning of the cutie mark, that is a very abstract concept because how does three diamonds relate to dressmaking, <laughs> or how does three bal- well three balloons relate to um. Uh, party. To party making that is kind of like obvious, but how do three butterflies mean animal care? That's... For all we know, it could be pollinization. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's like uh, I I do like this idea, and I like the fact that they are discussing this because the fandom has been discussing this for the longest. Mm-hmm. Um, there are there are quite many fanfics where the characters figure out that the meaning of their cutie marks has been completely misinterpreted all this time, and that they didn't really know what it meant. Well. Uh, you, you know, but to be perfectly honest, uh, here I go again with the honesty. I should be Applejack. Yeah. Uh, I still have no idea what does Twilight Sparkle's cutie mark mean. It's aside it's... from the fact that it appeared on the Tree of Harmony during Season 4. Yeah, I mean, so, the thing with I... cutie marks overall is, like, what are they? What do they mean? Because in Season 3 Ender, uh, Mystery Magical Cure, they switched cutie marks. Now their personality is different. Now they... Their job is different, not personality, but their job is different, and the personalities have to change. What does it mean? So, what does the cutie mark mean, in essence? And Diamond Tiara and Silver Spoon, they're jerks. So, does it mean their cutie marks make them jerks, or uh, have they been jerks all along? So, yeah. I fall back on the words of uh, Terry Pratchett for this. Talent defines what you do. It doesn't define who you are. We've had examples. You take Twilight and Sunset Shimmer. Uh, they both have magical aptitude. And I assume, because her cutie mark's never truly explained, but I think Sunset has a very similar uh, talent. And yet look at how polar diff- opposite they are in terms of uh, personality. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, but then, you know, everyone gets saying, oh, a cutie mark represents your, who you are. It's your personality, your destiny, your so on and so forth, especially the so on and so forth. <laughs> true that, true that. So at some point you just think, well, is it your personality? Is it your destiny? What is it? We just seem to make cutie marks whatever they need to be. Because in season one, they say that cutie mark is your talent. So 
from my understanding here, because okay, Sheriff Silver Star, he has a silver Sheriff Star, so obviously he'll become a sheriff. And Applejack has three apples, and her job is apple bucking or an apple orchard person. Or She's farm? apple ca- uh, uh, taking care of of uh, sweet apple acres. That is her job. Mm, so, so those are obvious things. And Rarity, uh, her tell well. Her talent or hobby is making dresses and she makes a living out of it, but her talent is finding gems. So, I, I guess there's that. I mean, the interpretation of cutie marks is confusing and I don't think we have the time and enough time to explain or bring up the analysis here about cutie marks. So, what? Well, we are not limited by time except for the amount of time that Silver has at, at his disposal to record these episodes. Yeah, but so I think we're fine. No, I think we're missing the point of we not reviewing the episode and we must keep on track. Norman, on if track. you if you say let's move on, I am going to kill you. I'm not saying. You know, you, it is, it is, well, no, or anything to the matter. You know how much I hate when you say that. Yeah, let's move on, let's move on. Ah, you're killing good I'm discussion saying, and conversation. You I'm jerk. not saying, but we're jumping way off track right now. Well, we were jumping way off track when we started on the review, because to be perfectly honest, again, with the perfectly honest, this is something that the episode um, uh, uh, fails at that, is that it feels a bit all over the place. Because we're following two stories at the same time. We're following troubleshoots on one side and the rodeo on the other. And they are not all that quite balanced up until they meet up at the middle point. I mean, for one, uh, we may have too much of the rodeo and not enough of troubleshoots. If you know what I mean. Well, we also have, um, we only have troubleshoots like halfway through the episode at most. Mm -hmm. So, and then we have the, and this is supposed to be a crusader's tale. They're supposed to be the chief instigators, but again, magical script viewing powers. Here's the, here's the thing that got me with that line. When I see a guy who's falling over and getting hurt, I mean, he was banging his head something awful in, in the, those scenes. I'm not thinking, oh my God, this is so funny. I'm thinking, oh God, is he okay? That's true. <laughs> okay, that's true. okay, that's if I saw someone in real life. Now, cartoon, if this were Looney Tunes, I'd know the premise is, you know, you fall off a cliff, you come away as slinky. Mm-hmm. It it doesn't look all that pleasant. But I do want to talk about how their idea, this episode's use of humor with trouble shoes and how it's, we're all supposed to laugh. And this is what I realized that as the episode went on, from, from after trouble shoes fell over and wrecked his own home, I realized, oh God, I feel bad for this guy. Everybody's making comparisons to Eeyore. Fair enough. I, I too saw the similarities, but Eeyore never got hurt. He, my image of him is always him just floating down the river, <laughs> could could get out of the water, but doesn't want to. He's too bummed. And that's kind of funny. And they say that humor is based on pain. It is actually a reaction to life's pain. Mm-hmm. That's true. So when, when you don't know how to react, you laugh. <laughs> uh, uh, but there there's a balancing point. One of the best bits of humor, one of the best pains is offended dignity. You take someone who is proud, who is noble, who is uh, uh, very proper, and you throw a pie in their face. And it's funny not just because maybe the pie stung just a little, mm-hmm. but because their humor, their pride is has taken a, a blow. A good example of that is Black Atta. Oh, yes. He acts so indignant <laughs> with everything. Then again, but... that's how the character of Black Adder was. I, I think I know where you're going with this, Silver, is that the uh, the balance between both sides of the character, the, the one that is gentle and likable, which is the Eeyore side, and the one that is supposed to get to get hurt, which is the, what I call the O.J. Simpson side, <laughs> there is no... They, they, they don't gel together. But I, I think here's the other reason, too, because well, going back to cutie marks, the, the how his personality or how his big build and clumsiness is, he's supposed to do that. But since he hasn't had an outlet to do that, he's, well, clumsy and out of practice. And everything he does in life represents that. I'm guessing if he was playing in the circus, moving around, knows what to do, knows how to take a fall, knows how to take a hit, 
he'll be more what's the word I'm looking for um coordinated in his personal life but as it is he's just depressed well, and so there's no humor in seeing someone getting stabbed in the eye after they've just been told they lost their family. Ouch. But no, th- there's the thing, because I don't know where to go from that. I'm just going to cut this one out. I'm uh, I'm going to just let that percolate for a while. You you stew on that for a little bit, okay? Okay. <laughs> uh, wow. That that just got grim. Damn straight. It's, it's not... It's not the nicest part of the episode, to be perfectly honest. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, as um, so the CMC is they they need to go back to town, and they they are taken uh, by travel shoes. Who knows the way to go back? And uh, right when they are being taken back, they capture travel shoes and they put them in jail because they assume that travel shoes kidnapped the Phillies, <laughs> who are suspiciously when... silent. <laughs> No, who, they, yeah, they tried to they, say something, but nobody gave them a chance to speak. Well, yeah, Applejack tells them to shut up, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then they don't say anything for the rest of the night. That's cold, Phillies. No, That's but cold. I think they were they're trying to do something, and I don't know this this situation where they cut to night to day kind of thing. Mm, I don't know. I I'm just saying that's cold, Phillies. That's cold. <laughs> but. Uh, yeah, they they put troubleshoots in jail, uh, where he destroys every single mattress that the sheriff's try, trying to give to him, only because he wants to see the rodeo. Mm-hmm. And uh, we see uh, suitable needlessly taking the the keys and taking them away right before they lure the sheriff out, thus making suitable taking the keys completely pointless. Yeah, um, I'm actually not. Sure on that. I think you you could make the argument that if she takes them off, the sheriff can't grab them on his way out. Mm, could be, could be. I, I need to point out something first before we move away from this scene. Trouble shoes breaking the bed and the sheriff saying, stop it. We, I, I don't think I have enough stock for new beds. That's funny. It's a joke, son. You can laugh. Applause sign, applause sign. No, wait a minute. Laugh sign, laugh sign. (laughs) But it's true, it's true because that set up, okay, trouble shoes, looks outside, oh, I want to see the rodeo, and breaks the bed, and Sheriff says, stop it because I can't um, replace new beds. That that whole setup there was funny, but I don't know if it's fair for trouble shoes. Well, nothing's fair. I mean, otherwise he wouldn't be living this life. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. This life of humor where I could make all kinds of grim, dark comparisons. Oh, no. I do like the fact that the CMCs are a bit more active in this episode rather than being the spectators. But, yeah, they kind of take the, they kind of take a backseat for almost everything else. Hell, I say that Applejack has more, uh, uh, uh more highlights than the CMCs do because like when 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 we go see the rodeo and we see her uh, bucking this haystacks and uh, she breaks the record, that is a very neat moment for AJ. Or uh, when the clowns appear and one of the one of the uh, little playful balls uh, falls on <laughs> on Braveheart's head, that is also a memorable moment. Uh, needless to say, everything that has to do with troubleshoots. But the CMCs, I don't remember a single scene that they they have kind of like the spotlight. They are just there. This is kind of like the the opposite of Twilight Time, where Twilight was just there, while the CMCs in here are just there. They don't do anything else. Well, it could be the focus of the storytelling here, because in the beginning we had the CMCs, in the middle they're a key component to the story, but near the end it's all about trouble shoes. But I also feel bad for Applejack. Once again, she went to a rodeo, and this time she won the prize, and she got snow credit. <laughs> her own family stitching her. The truth is, yes, Applejack, way to go. <laughs> Applejack and her rodeos bring nothing but pain oh. to her. Oh, yeah. And she looks so proud with that silly-looking uh, trophy. So it's, it's a pony with three. Haystacks on it. Who did they commission to come up with that trophy design? I don't know. Oh, this was done by my granny. She's a good designer. Don't you be mean to my granny. 
<laughs> also, may I point out, I think they unintentionally, or maybe intentionally, made a reference to, um, uh, to James Bond with the way that the, they designed the clown makeup on Troubleshoes. Oh, how come? It looks an awful lot like the makeup that, uh, like the, the clown makeup that Roger Moore wears in, uh, in one of the James Bond movies. Hmm. Okay, could be a reference. That must be one I haven't seen yet. It's uh, it's one with a very unfortunate title that I am not going to see here because ah. technically it should be censored. Okay. Oh, <laughs> that one. Okay. Oh, does yeah. that it? It involves the the number eight. Uh, yes, it involves a, 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 a version of the number eight in eight. Latin. Okay. Eight, okay. Eight, eight cat. Yeah. Eight cat. Yes. That exactly. One. It's eight cat. Oh my. God. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> That's the movie that I'm talking about. It looks an awful lot like it, all the way down to the uh, blue inverted triangle. If I'm not mistaken, uh, on, uh, on Roger Moore is not one of the best Bond, right? Uh, he's, he's my favorite. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah he's uh, Daniel Craig for me, but I, I've been watching... The, I just saw Moonraker not two weeks ago. My brain still hasn't rebooted. <laughs> uh, Moonraker is, is lovably memorable, as the movie is. I still like it though. Anyway, like we're not talking about James Bond. We're talking about the uh, how troubleshoots erupts on the on the on the rodeo. Basically, uh, side all over the rodeo, uh, erupting all, all over it <laughs> with Brayburn. Oh no! Oh god! Oh we, yes. Bra- Bra- Brayburn also gets re- re- uh, relegated to comic relief as well. <laughs> Everything starts falling onto him. Don't read it, much into that, please. <laughs> it, it, it's his punishment for not being a good full sitter. Yes. <laughs> he seems very happy to have all of that haystack on his face, though. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if that. I don't know if that's so much happiness or brain damage. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. <laughs> but there, there, there is one moment where it kind of confused me because this is what I thought they were going. Uh, Troubleshoot was going to reveal his identity because I mean this is telegraphed pretty early as soon as he steps into the rodeo, I am like, okay, when is going to be the moment where they realize that it's troubleshoes? And they are like, oh, we were wrong all along. I thought it was the moment where his trousers fall over. That's... Because who else Who else has that cutie mark, though? No, who else has that built? That's the thing. Yeah, well, I mean... Toys so... are not the brightest bulbs some days. <laughs> they really aren't, aren't they? They're not very clever. But, yeah, it doesn't take them too long to figure out that it is troubleshoes. And it takes them, like, what, two seconds to get out the pitchforks and the torches? Yep. <laughs> that was my favorite running gag of the entire episode, by the way. These two ponies carry a, pre- a pitchfork and a torch, just in case we need to lynch somebody. Yeah. It is awesome. Yep. Uh, it's like they have a riot on sale. That was brilliant. I like, I'm sorry, but I really like that, uh, I really like that visual gag. I think it's pretty funny. Yeah. Th- that, um, that's, that's good because they were disappointed when the sheriff said no. <laughs> no. Oh, we wanted to lynch something. We just saw young Frankenstein. Come on. But here they explain, oh, uh, well, Sheriff Silverstar is going to reprimand troubleshoots for his crime about, oh, he, uh, destruct the rodeo, but he said that, oh, he didn't mean to because he was just, well, he loves the rodeo and all of those were just accidents because of how he is clumsy. And when Sheriff Silverstar says, okay, that we can forgive, but the other thing, we can't forgive you kidnapping the foals. What and that's she... when the CMCs go and say, yeah, you want to see instant cut to them getting punished for <laughs> <laughs> going on their own. Yeah. Yeah. Also, Sweetable's getting tough. She went from being unable to lift a broom to lifting a barrel. Did she lift it? Or? She's li- well, she's kind of rolling it, but I am like, that is an upgrade. Well done, girl. You're getting good with your magic. Mm-hmm. Well, you, you could say she's just getting over a barrel. <laughs> <laughs> mm. oh, wow. Read from that what you will. It's like you're trying to get beyond Thunderdome. <laughs> uh, I get that reference. Thanks, Steve Rogers. <laughs> uh, no problem. But yeah, after Applejack reprimands the CMCs saying that they had to, they have to clean the rodeo as punishment while she goes back home and shows off her new trophy to anyone who cares. 
and troubleshoot. There's no one. <laughs> <laughs> and troubleshoot having found his place in the rodeo. Yeah, well, all ends at end, well, I guess. All's well that ends well. Yeah, they they did manage to help uh, to help a guy find his place in in life. Mm-hmm. That is, that's something that anyone could enjoy. And with that, the episode ends. Yep. So it just, and yeah, it just sort of ends. It's like, okay, well, that's nice. We we never actually see trouble shoes again. Which will be a shame, but hey, you never know. Hopefully, we might see him again someday. True that. True that. In season twenty-seven. <laughs> Can you imagine reaching to season twenty-seven? Oh, it'll be like The if, Simpsons. Uh, yes, I'm sure by that point we'll all be hipster and be like. Earth, this has gotten so old. I'm, I no longer find this amusing. Yeah, dude, there is already people going like that. I started watching MLP in 2010, and I don't see the need to watch it again. Oh wow, that's very hipsterish. I think that, that is. That's not a word. But then again, that's just my opinion. <laughs> uh, but but okay, with the episode over and all that, you know what? I think I, I think I might tone down my opinion of this episode a lot compared to the beginning of it. Like, I still think it is uh, the best representation of the Wild West we have had in MLP, but it could have been better. Mm, I think this episode uses the theme of the Wild West as a storytelling engine or storytelling method. But if you really dissect it, it's not about the West. It's all about the cutie marks. If you put this in Manhattan, Cloudsdale, or any other place, it'll work the same. Yeah, but then you, then it would be what a slapstick comedian. I'm not sure. It basically, it a lot of people have commented how this seems to fly in the face of what we learned about cutie marks just two episodes ago. That's the thing. That, that's my that's my issue or that's my problem with this episode because the person that's explaining all this are the ones that don't have it yet, and how do they know that? Troubleshoes is misinterpreting his cutie mark. Because they think if you fall down, you must it must be funny. <laughs> yeah. I think I broke something. Oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> I can't feel my legs. Oh, so funny. <laughs> yeah, but then again, it goes back to what you were talking about uh, with the MLP comics. I know MLP comics and all that. And the, uh, the slapstick in it that usually the slapstick only works with the reaction of the characters around it and uh, how long it lasts and how much it hurts. I mean, the the element of a good slapstick is that it has to hurt, the characters around it are not meant to react to it horrified, and the the, the effect should last only for like that few seconds. It shouldn't o- go over long. An example of bad slapstick will be the one in the good, the bad, and the ponies. I will think that this, the slapstick in this episode, is is a much better example. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, but it, but even then, I say if a guy has no dignity to offend, then all you're do it feels more like the universe is bullying him. Yeah, the comedy in here with trouble shoes. It's okay if you isolate it. It's funny, him being clumsy at his own home. How do you manage to be clumsy in your own home? A blind person walks in his own home, knows where everything is. But you, how do you even manage? And this kind of comedy with seeing a person in pain is funny. I'm going to take a good example in the first Austin Powers. Or was it second? I don't remember. But when Will Ferrell's character is down with the wolves or the weasels, I don't remember. And Austin's just up there looking at him and him trying to get out of the hole by himself and explaining every little detail that he's going through was funny to me. But I don't know if it's funny for you guys. Yeah, so, uh, help, help. I think my leg is broken. Yes, I'm going to try to stand up. Yes, it's definitely broken. But there, there's two bits of funny to that. It's not so much... One, we identify with, like, the severe pain, but he's having the completely opposite reaction. It's, it's, the pain is our betrayed expectations. Mm-hmm. And, and speaking of, uh, dignity and other things, I, I think this effect will work well if the person that is 
getting the pie in the face is Prince Blue Bud. We all do not like Blue Blood because of reasons. He's a snobbish prince who thinks he's always right and stuff. So him getting a pie to the face or falling down the stairs or whatever it is, we find it funny because he deserves it. Yay. But poor Troubleshoes here, he he doesn't deserve the thing that is happening to him. Uh, maybe he was reincarnated uh, from an evil... Maybe he was King Sombra in a past life. <laughs> oh. And this is perfect justice. <laughs> I don't... Well, probably, I don't know. That's it, Cannon. But him having the ending that he have here is, well, well-deserved. That's all I have to say. And Braeburn exists. And he talked again. Let the shipping commence. Yes, indeed. And James? <laughs> yeah, what? Well, um, I, I think me and Silver shared the thoughts. <laughs> Would you want me to say what I thought of this episode after I, uh, after, uh, basically having my mind changed about it? Um, we don't mean to, but yes. I, I do mean to. I meant to control your mind. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, uh, no, it, it is perfectly fine because, I mean, I didn't have the chance to rewatch this episode as much as I watched the others. But then again, that gave me the, ta- the 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 chance to rethink my opinion of it. And as you guys were talking about it, it made me realize this episode has a lot of good ideas in it, and a lot of good concepts in it, and it doesn't uh, execute all of them well. In fact, I will say it doesn't execute more than half of them well. Uh, I think the, the I stand by what I said. I love Troubleshoes. I love his character. And yeah, okay, the comedy aimed towards him gets very mean uh, especially towards the very end but I kind of kind of like that I don't know and I I kind of enjoy that, that, that sort of comedy because I kind of like a comedy that gets mean I mean not mean spirited but you know mean for a for a kids cartoon uh, I do like the fact that they brought the whole discussion about uh, how you can misinterpret your special talent. I don't like the way that they executed it, but I like the fact that they are bringing it up mm-hmm. because that's something that the fans have been wanting to to have the show talk about for the longest. I mean, it didn't really work, but I applaud the effort. But then again, the effort is nothing if you don't know how how to execute them, but that doesn't break the deal for me. Uh, I think this is... Um, I think this might fall as one of Dave Polsky's uh, weakest episodes. Um, I... Don't see myself rewatching it many times aside from seeing more of Troubleshoes. Mm-hmm. And it kind of makes me really sad that we may not see him again oh, no. uh, for a long time. It, it took us four seasons to have another Braver in a speaking role. I think we may not see Troubleshoes ever again. Well, it depends on the f- fans. If they want more <sighs> Troubleshoes, he'll be in a future episode. Just have to wait and see. I don't know. Fans don't always know what's best for them. Yeah, true, true. Yeah, yeah, that is true. That is true. Sometimes listening to the fans is not the best of the ideas. Hello, Sonic. Uh, yeah, don't talk about that. Hello, Sonic. You're looking very tall today. Okay, honestly, I have to break here. Uh, Sonic Boom, the cartoon, is a not bad show. It's very funny in terms of what it wants to do, but the game, hey, don't buy Oh, no worries on that score. I haven't bought a Sonic game in a very long time, which I'm not sure is what you want to hear, but... Right when you thought that the video... uh, And just talking about the video games, when they couldn't get worse after Sonic 2006, there comes Sonic Boom to make you appreciate what you had in the past. The game, yes. The cartoon is awesome. I like it. No, the cartoon is is very fun. The video game is god-awful. People apparently forget that (laughs) that the the, the, the appeal of Sonic comes from the video games. Mm. But then again... That is a discussion for another time. Uh, for, another now, we, <laughs> for now, we are done speaking about ponies and and My Little Pony. Now, mm-hmm. we're going to see you on the next uh, review, which is going to be episode 7 of season 5. Uh, make uh, friends, but uh, make new friends, but keep Discord, written by Natasha Levinger. But that will be a review for another time. Thank you guys so much for checking this out, for watching us, and we'll see you all on the next review. I have been James Cork. And I have been Norman Sanzo. Please, no, don't. And I'll be the most rootinest, tootinest, hipperest in the Wild West. Dog, I'm a silver quail. 
I hate the both of you with the passion of a thousand suns. And I hope that you... Well, sounds like some partner needs the ambulance. <laughs> uh, you? you guys, really, I hate you. I hate you. I hate you. <laughs> My God, with this country, it seems goddamn. See y'all next week. Adios. <laughs> no. <laughs>